Um, in the alien abduction context, I've, I've been trying to uh, understand and talk up the idea that humans hallucinate, that it's a common part of, uh, of human nature. Yes, under conditions of sensory deprivation or drugs or uh, deprival of REM sleep, but also just in the ordinary course of, of existence. I have, maybe a dozen times since my parents died, heard one of them say, my name. Just single first word, Carl. I'm not surprised by it. I miss them. They called me by my first name so much during the time they were alive. It had great psychic roots. So my brain plays it back every now and then. It doesn't surprise me at all. I sort of like it. But it is a hallucination. And if I was a little less skeptical, I could see how easy it would be to say, who? Where, where are they? They're, they're, they're here somewhere. I can hear them. Raymond Moody, who is uh, an MD, I think, an author who spends lots of time uh, writing innumerable books on uh, life after death, actually quoted me in the first chapter of his latest book, saying that I, you know, I heard my parents calling me Carl, saying, look, even he believes in life after death. <laughs> Missing the whole point. And if this is one of the arguments from chapter one of the latest book of the principal exponent of this, I don't think he has a good case. But still, but still, suppose I wasn't steeped in, uh, in the virtues of scientific skepticism and felt the same way about my parents. And along comes somebody who says, I can put you in touch with them. And suppose they're smart and they found out something about uh, my parents in the past and they're good at uh, faking voices and so on, darkened room and incense and all of that. I could see being really swept away emotionally. That's not hard to understand. Now, would you think less of me in that case if I had no background in skepticism, no idea of why it's a virtue, but had the sense that it was grumpy and negative and rejecting everything that was uh, humane. Wouldn't you think that, uh, that there's something wrong with rejecting my openness to the medium con man or woman? What I'm trying to say is that the one deficiency which I see in the skeptical movement is an us versus them. A sense that we have a monopoly on the truth. Those other people who believe in all these stupid doctrines are morons and uh, they're, uh, or worse. And uh, that's it. If you're sensible, you listen to us. If not, to hell with you. That is non-constructive. That does not get our message across. That condemns us to permanent minority status. Whereas, an approach which from the beginning acknowledges the human roots of these problems, understands that the society has arranged things so that skept for very good reasons, that skepticism is not well taught. By very good reasons, I mean very good reasons for the protection of those in power. If skepticism is well understood, then who is the skepticism going to be applied to except those in power? Those in power do not have a vested interest in everybody being able to ask searching questions. If, um, if we understand that, then we have compassion to the abductees and those who startled come upon the crop circles and believe that they are supernatural, and then we have a much better chance of, uh, of succeeding. I think it is key for us to make science and the scientific method more attractive, especially to the young, because that's a battle for the future. And as I look through this audience, 
I see a very nice mixed distribution of ages, I, which I think is a very positive and hopeful sign. The sign of a dying cult is everybody is as old as I am. <laughs> now, science involves an amazing, seemingly self-contradictory mix. On the one hand, it requires an almost complete openness to all ideas, no matter how bizarre and weird they sound. As I walk along, my time slows down, I shrink in the direction of motion, and I get more massive, excuse me, Ken. That's crazy. On the scale of the very small, the molecule can be in that position and that position, but it is prohibited from being in any intermediate position. That's wild. But the first is special relativity, the second is quantum mechanics, and like it or not, that's the way the world is. And if you only say, well, that's ridiculous, you will be forever closed to the major findings of science. On the other hand, science requires the most vigorous and uncompromising skepticism, because the vast majority of ideas are simply wrong. And the only way you can distinguish the right from the wrong, the wheat from the chaff, is by testing. It is no fun, as I said at the beginning, to be on the receiving end of the testing. But it is the penalty we pay for having so powerful a tool as science.